welcome. Thank you all for thank you all for joining us today uh, at the Holocaust Center. Our program for in my own words with Dan Gunfeld. I uh, give you a little bit about Dan. He's a former basketball player and an accomplished writer. He's a proud graduate of Stanford University. He's an academic, all-American, all-conference basketball uh, selection at Stanford. Dan played professionally for eight, season, eight seasons in the top leagues around the world, including Germany, Spain, and Israel. Dan's writing has been published in more than 40 times in media outlets such as Sports Illustrated, the Jerusalem Post, and NBC News. Dan earned his MBA from the Stanford Graduate School of Business in 2017 and lives with his wife and son in the San Francisco Bay Area, where he works in venture capital. Today we're going to talk about, we're going to have Dan is going to introduce us to his book, By the Grace of the Game, and Dan's talk is going to recount his incredible family journey told in the book, By the Grace of the Game, which is the story of an ordinary family thrust into extraordinary circumstances. Surviving the horrors of the Holocaust, deceiving a brutal communist regime, and adapting to life as an illiterate refugee caring for a dying son in New York City are only the beginnings. The true improbability of this family story lies in the discovery of a game, the game of basketball, that unknowingly held the power to heal wounds, build bridges, and tie together generations of a fractured family. If the magnitude of the American dream is measured by the intensity of the nightmare of, that came before and the heights of the triumph achieved after, and by the grace of the game, recounts an American dream story of unprecedented scale. From the grips of the Nazis at the top of the Olympic podium, to the cheap seats in the center stage at Madison Square Garden, from the yellow stars to silver spoons, this striking family saga traverses the vast spectrum of the human experience and details how perseverance, love, and legacy can survive through generations carried on the solid shoulders of a simple and beautiful game, a vehicle that no one could have predicted. Dan, welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, and I'll go ahead and turn everything over to you. So, sounds great. Thank you so much, Steve. Thank you to everyone who joined. I'm looking forward to telling you more about my family story. And so I'll, I'll speak about the story for about a half hour or so, take any questions. So again, thank you all so much for spending a little time today. So as Steve mentioned from my bio, you know, I played basketball at Stanford and basketball and my family's last name are kind of synonymous with each other. And I had a nice career, but it was really my dad who was a legend of the game of basketball. My dad's name is Ernie Grunfeld. Uh, he was a high school basketball All-American out of Queens, New York, a college basketball All-American at the University of Tennessee, and a longtime NBA player and executive. Uh, my dad was one of the inaugural classes inducted into the New York City Basketball Hall of Fame. He's in the Jewish Sports Hall of Fame, the International Jewish Sports Hall of Fame, the Tennessee Hall of Fame. He's in more Hall of Fames than I can count really became a legend of the game of basketball. Um, and he's very well known in sports, but what is not well known, or at least what wasn't well known until my book came out, is that my dad is the only player in NBA history whose parents are Holocaust survivors. I did a year and a half of research preparing to write my book. And that research suggests my dad is the only athlete in the history of any of the major American sports leagues. So that's the NBA, the NHL, the NFL, and Major League Baseball. My dad is the only athlete in any of those sports whose parents are Holocaust survivors. Um, I, I mentioned, you know, my success in, in basketball, my dad's great success in basketball. Despite all that, it's really my grandmother who is the star of our family and the star of our story. She's, of course, a Holocaust survivor, as I mentioned. You'll all be happy to know she's 97 years old. She lives in the Bay Area. Speak to her every day. We FaceTime with my kids every day. Uh, she she's really why this story matters and so it really starts with her so let me tell you a little bit about her background my grandmother is from transylvania on the border of romania and hungary she was born into a big happy orthodox jewish family 10 to 10 children total so she had nine siblings and two loving parents I, I go to great lengths in my book to describe what life was like for my family before the Holocaust, because we know the numbers of those affected, right? Six million Jews and millions more, but these weren't just numbers. These were people, these were human beings who lived and laughed and loved. And so it, it was really important to me to paint that picture, to show what life was like before the Nazis invaded. Um, so when that happened, when the Nazis invaded, my grandmother happened to be visiting an older sister in Budapest. She was 17 years old. 
they got a letter from their father almost immediately that said, if that said, come home right now. And so they packed their bags. They were ready to go to the train station the following day when they received another letter from my great grandfather. And all it said was, if you can stay where you are. And that was the last communication that my grandmother ever had with her beloved father. He was taken to Auschwitz where he was killed. His name was Solomon Samuel. My oldest son's name is Solomon after him. Uh, my grandma says to this day that it was that second letter from my great grandfather that saved her from Auschwitz. And so she was on the run in Budapest and she had a chance to survive. She slept in bombed out buildings. She you know, got food wherever she could find it. If you read my book, you'll get to know my grandmother. She has everything that a human being could have that would allow them to survive something like the Holocaust. She's smart, she's savvy, she's disciplined. She has an incredible will to live. She also has great humility because she's the first one to say that you could have had all those things back then and it didn't matter. You needed luck and you needed help. And my grandmother had both those things. Uh, if you read my book, you'll read about the soldier who gave her an extra piece of bread the soldier who gave her a kiss on the cheek. There was a fellow prisoner who gave her a pair of pants to keep her warm, right? There were all these gestures of kindness and humanity that, that helped her survive. The greatest help that my grandmother got to survive the Holocaust was from legendary Swedish diplomat Raoul Wallenberg. And if there are folks on the call today who are students of the Holocaust, you know Raoul Wallenberg regarded as one of the greatest heroes of the Holocaust, credited for saving roughly 100,000 Jews in Budapest. And my grandmother was one of them, but he didn't just save her life once. He saved her life twice. So the first way was that he issued what were called Schutz passes. So they were protective passports that gave Jews in Budapest a level of security. Uh, and so my grandmother was able to get a pass for herself, but she risked her life to obtain 17 passes for other people. So I often say my grandmother is not only my hero, she's also a hero. And that's the truth. She saved other people's lives. So with her Schutz pass, you know, she had a level of protection in Budapest for a while, but eventually because of a change in government, that pass was no longer recognized. She was captured by the Nazis eventually. She was placed in the Budapest ghetto. It was in the ghetto where she was reunited with one of her brothers. She, she didn't know what was happening to her family. Everyone was separated. Uh, she knew that several of her brothers were in working camps. One of them had already been killed in a working camp, but they didn't have information. And so my grandmother was reunited with one of her brothers in the ghetto. Now, while they lived, while they were in the ghetto, the Nazis stayed outside the perimeter. They let Jews administer daily life, right, while, while they stayed outside. So towards the end of the war, my grandma and her brother saw 20 Nazis enter the Budapest ghetto with machine guns over their shoulders. And word quickly spread that they were there to kill the remaining 80,000 Jews in the Budapest ghetto. Imagine that, a massacre planned to kill 80,000 people. So my grandmother and her brother, they raced up the stairs of the building that they were sleeping in. They found a small attic space where they crammed inside. There were room for roughly four or five people, but there were more than a dozen you know, packed in there fighting for their lives. They waited for 10 minutes and then 20 minutes and then an hour and nothing happened. Eventually, they had someone go check. The Nazis had retreated. Shortly thereafter, Russian and Romanian soldiers liberated the Budapest ghetto. They were free to go. That's how my grandmother survived the Holocaust. And she didn't learn why the Nazis retreated. She, she wasn't asking any questions at that point, right? She was free, and that's all that mattered. So that was 1945. In 1985, at this point in time, my grandmother's living in the Bay Area. My dad is a huge basketball star in the United States. And a movie was made about Raul Wallenberg's life. And Richard Chamberlain played the title character, Raul Wallenberg. It was in that movie that my grandmother saw one of the final scenes of Wallenberg learning about the order to massacre the remaining Jews in the Budapest ghetto, getting in his car, racing to the ghetto's gates, confronting the general and telling him, let these people go, the war is over you'll be a murderer. These are innocent people, let them go. And so it took my grandmother 40 years to learn that Wallenberg saved her life, not just once, but twice during the war. Um, I talked to a lot of you know, youngsters and students about this book, about my family story. And 
I always tell them, you know, heroes do look different and should look different. And if you, you want to know what a, what a real hero looks like, all you have to do is Google Raul Wallenberg. You know, he wasn't Jewish. He just, he risked his life to help those in need. And he ultimately lost his life. You know, he was apprehended by the Russians after the war and he was never seen again. And so he is such a symbol of what it looks like to stand up for what is right, to do the right thing and to be a hero. When my grandmother got home to her small village in, in rural Romania in Transylvania, right there on the border of Romania and Hungary, she would learn that five of her siblings and both of her parents were killed. At this time, my grandfather, you know, dur during the Holocaust was a prisoner in a forced labor camp in Hungary where, where he survived. Uh, he lost both of his sisters and his parents. So, uh, you know, you know that you know, my family has this history with basketball. We also have this history with the Holocaust, right? How do you connect those dots? How, how did the family form? And so people, a lot of people have asked me, you know, when did your grandparents meet? And I have to answer that honestly. The day my grandmother got back from surviving, one of her older brothers was already home. He had been liberated months prior. And all my grandmother had to wear was a raggedy blue overcoat, a thin cotton dress and some beat up shoes. That's what she was wearing every day in Budapest. The, her house had been looted, completely ransacked. Everything was gone. Her older brother said, OK, first thing we need to do is get you some clothes. She said, I made friends with someone in our labor camp. He is from this area. And when we got home, he opened up a small store nearby. Let's take you there to get you some clothes. And so it was the day my grandmother got home from surviving the Holocaust that she walked through the door of my grandfather's store. And in preparing to write my book, as I mentioned, I did a year and a half of research. And part of that was interviewing my grandmother, interviewing my dad. And I remember asking my grandma, how do you go on? You know, you, you, your parents, both your parents are murdered. Five of your siblings are murdered. How, how do you keep going? And she said, what we did is we started families because that's the only way to rebuild. And so my grandparents met, got married quickly, had my uncle, you know, not long after being married and eight years later had my dad. So I mentioned my dad's history in basketball, being this very well-known athlete and executive. My dad was born in Romania under communism, you know, from the shadows of the Holocaust, he was born. It took my family more than a decade to be able to leave communist Romania. And so for my grandparents, they spent roughly 20 years under communism after having survived the Holocaust. Con the Romanians are, are particularly known for their brutality under communism. You know, my grandparents had friends who were jailed, tortured, or even killed just for telling a joke or saying one word that wasn't to the government's liking. I mean, there was extreme brutality they were able to eventually leave Romania because the state of Israel offered to pay money for each Jew that the communists would allow to leave. And so that's how my grandparents got their visas and my family got their visas to, to leave Romania. Uh, of course, they were not allowed to take anything of value with them. You know, they were searched at the train station. My, my grandma even still talks about my eight-year-old dad putting his hands in the air and the communist officers patting him down. You know, it was so they couldn't take anything of value with them. My grandparents had, sa had saved up quite a bit of money on the black market in Romania over 10 years. Uh, you know, and, and it was illegal, but it wasn't shameful. It was the only way to survive. Everyone did that. And so they had a thousand dollars worth of Romanian money and four thousand American dollars. And, you know, my grandparents, you know, as they were leaving, said, we how can we not take this money? Right. But then you you're trying you're fleeing communism, you know, communist Romania as refugees. Right. So you just can't take anything with them. But with you. But my uh, grandparents had chutzpah. They said, we have to figure out a way. And so I'll let you read the book to figure out how my grand to, to learn how my grandparents got every cent to their name out of communist Romania. But they did. They got all the Romanian money out. That was a plan that my grandfather hatched and executed. Very gutsy. The American dollars, there were more of them and they were much more risky. Improbably, my grandparents got help smuggling their illegal money out of communist Romania from one of the biggest comedic celebrities in the United States, Buddy Hackett. Sometimes truth is stranger than fiction, but Buddy Hackett helped my family smuggle their illegal money out of Romania. Uh, and so you, you can pick up the book 
and read how that happened, but, but truly amazing. And also Buddy Hackett is a symbol, right? Of, we know him for his comedy and he's a, a legendary comedian, but he did something for my family that I'll never forget. And now that the book is out there, I can't tell you how many people have reached out to me about what he did. And so, yes, he's a famous comedian, but he's, he's more than that to me and, and to my family. And so it took my family again, 10 years to get those, to get those visas. They arrived in New York city in 1964. When my dad stepped foot on American and US soil for the first time, he spoke fluent Hungarian, Romanian, and Italian. He didn't speak a word of English and he had never touched a basketball. Uh, you know, my grandparents, because they were Holocaust survivors, they weren't formally educated. They, they couldn't be because of the war. They had to build a life. And so my grandfather got a job painting houses in Connecticut. My grandmother got a job working at a t-shirt factory in Brooklyn. Uh, they were already living the American dream just by being in the United States. You know, they had a chance to work for a living, for their kids to have an education, to have freedom, right? Those are things that they have never really had before. For my dad, he was, you know, he had to assimilate. He was made fun of by kids because he didn't speak the language. And so there was, there was an, a, certainly an adjustment period, but they had a chance at a new life in America. I mentioned that my uncle was born not long after my grandparents got married. He was eight years older than my dad. To give you some context, what my dad called my uncle in their native language, Hungarian, translates to English as my king. So you could imagine a little brother calling his big brother, my king. You know, that's how much my dad looked up to and revered his older brother. So my uncle was diagnosed with leukemia a few months after arriving in the United States, and he passed away within a year at 17 years old. And so despite my grandparents surviving the Holocaust, being uprooted from my dad, being uprooted from his homeland as a young, young boy, all this tragedy, my, my uncle dies. And, and that, that was the, the biggest trauma for my family, despite all the loss from the Holocaust, you know, for my grandparents to lose their son and for my dad to lose his brother was crushing, you know, it's a hole that can't be filled. I'm very honest about this. In my book, I'm named after my uncle. His name was Lutzi in Hungarian, but Leslie in English. My middle name is Leslie. I've always carried that with me and taken that obligation seriously. You know, my pursuits and motivations, you know, in basketball and in the classroom, you know, he's, he's a big part of that. And so that was the situation that my dad found himself in, you know, been uprooted from his homeland, made fun, being made fun of because he didn't speak the language loses his hero, his parents have to work to, to build a life. And so he did, like all the other kids in the neighborhood in Queens, New York were doing, he went to the local, local playground. And what they did at the playground was they played basketball. And for him, it was a way to make friends, to learn English and to heal from the loss of his brother. You know, he didn't have any big expectations or big dreams. He just, he just wanted something to belong to. And so, you know, my book is called By the Grace of the Game. And now you all know a little bit about my family story. You know where we started, you know where, my, where we ended up through the game of basketball. You can probably understand why we called the book that. You know, the game of basketball shined its light on my family when we really needed it. And so, you know, it didn't take long for my dad to be, you know, a good basketball player and then one of the best basketball players at the park and then one of the best basketball players in the city. In my book, I really juxtapose the way my dad grew up, my family, my ancestors grew up to my own upbringing. I was born into great privilege. You know, at the time of my birth, my dad was an NBA basketball player for the New York Knicks. My birth was literally planned around the NBA basketball schedule. You know, I was delivered by C-section and my dad went on one long road trip. He was there for my birth. He went on another long road trip and he was there for my bris. So I, I was quite literally born into the game of basketball, uh, but my my dad, you know, and my ancestors, they had no such luxuries. And so my grandparents didn't see my dad play basketball until he was a junior in high school. Whereas for me, my mom was taking me to all my games. My dad was coming. My sister was supporting me. My grandparents knew my dad was playing basketball, but they didn't really know what was going on. And so one day they opened up a fabric store in the Bronx. That's how they made a living. They worked, you know, six, seven days a week at the store. And one day they got a call at the store from my dad's high school basketball coach. And he said, my grandmother answered and he said, Miss Grunfeld, you need to watch your son play basketball. He's, he's special. And 
the reason my grandparents hadn't seen my dad play is because my dad's games were in the early afternoon and my grandparents would have to close their fabric store to watch him. And they, you know, they had to work. They were all about the work. And so they had never closed their store. The following week, they closed their store. They went to my dad's high school to see a game, but they didn't close the store quite early enough. So once they got, when they got to the gym, the game had already started and it was full. And the usher at the door said, the game, you know, gym's full, game started, can't let you in. My grandparents' English was, wasn't that good. My grandpa said, you know, we're guests of coach, we're parents of player. He said, there's nothing we can do, sorry. And for whatever reason, my grandmother said, our son's name is Ernie Grunfeld. You know, she didn't even know what that meant, but his eyes lit up immediately. He opened the door and he said, well, why didn't you say that? Walk them into the gym. You know, this is the, their first time seeing my dad. And my grandmother still tells this story. They were in this gym in New York, looking around. My grandpa, you know, nudged my grandma's elbow and in Hungarian, he said, well, if Ernie's such a great player, why isn't he on the court? And my grandma grabbed him and she said, look right there. That's Ernie. And she pointed to the middle of the floor. My, the symbolism of that is incredible, right? My grandpa could not recognize my dad. He had literally transformed from this at-risk immigrant youth who had lost his brother, who was teased by kids to someone in a position of power. You know, he was, he was big, strong, motivated, coordinated. He had kind of found his sense of place on the basketball court. My grandpa used to make my dad come to their fabric store to work on Saturdays, which my dad really disliked. And on the court after that first game, my grandpa said to my dad, you never come to the store again. Just work on your basketball and we'll take care of the rest. And so a year later, my dad was an all-American basketball player, one of the most highly recruited players in the country. He chose to go to the University of Tennessee, where he was a four-time All-SEC player. He left Tennessee as the school's all-time leading scorer and as the second leading scorer in the history of the SEC conference. Uh, that was in 1977, by the way. To this day, my dad is the fifth leading scorer in the history of the SEC, which is the best conference in the country for basketball. That just shows you kind of how, what a phenomenon he was as a college basketball player. At Tennessee, he teamed with Bernard King, who was another New Yorker, became an NBA Hall of Famer, basketball Hall of Famer, NBA All-Star, led the NBA in scoring. And my dad and Bernard King were one of the greatest duos in college basketball history. You know, they were known as the Ernie and Bernie show. Uh, Bernard is a black man from Brooklyn. My dad is a white immigrant from Queens. You know, they went down to Knoxville and they became legends together and separately. And although they're from the same city, they're from much different worlds, but it kind of is representative of the, the, the role basketball plays because it, it brings people together. And my dad and Bernard still talk every month, you know, we're like family and that's what the game can do. And so what's really amazing about my dad's trajectory, my dad's journey is that when he was at the University of Tennessee, he had a chance to represent the United States. Now he became a United States citizen. It took him 24 hours to become a, a US citizen because of his scoring ability, right? It took my grandparents, as I mentioned, 10 years to leave communism, it took my dad 24 hours to become a citizen because of his ability on the basketball court. He was invited to try out for the US Olympic team after his junior season. And he made that Olympic team. And so this time my grandparents closed their store for two weeks and they drove from Queens, New York to Montreal, Canada, and they watched my dad stand on top of the Olympic podium as a gold medalist for the United States. This is roughly 10 years after arriving in the United States, not speaking English. So again, my book is called By the Grace of the Game. You know, from all the way from the Holocaust to watching my dad stand on top of the Olympic podium wearing the Stars and Stripes. It's, you know, it's, it's why I wrote the story. I, it's, it's my family's version of a very universal story. How do you overcome adversity? How do you keep going? How, you know, the love of family, tradition, legacy, those are all the themes represented in my book. And then of course, I'm the generation that carries this history. You know, and I had my career at Stanford and my professional career, which by the way, was, was very different than my dad's. You know, it kind of intersected. I was born in an affluent suburb of New York City and I made my career in Europe. My dad was born under communism in Europe. He became an NBA basketball player. And so I also write a lot about in the book about my goal to play basketball at Stanford. That wasn't something that happened casually or happened easily. 
I wanted to go to Stanford from the time I was in seventh grade because my grandmother lived 25 minutes from campus. And when we were looking at colleges for my older sister and we visited Stanford, I fell in love. You know, great school, great basketball program and close to my grandma. And so it became my dream to play there. You know, I write in my book, you know, it was a long shot for a slow Jewish kid from the suburbs, which is exactly what I was. But I had great examples in my life of people who had overcome unthinkable things, who had achieved, you know, to really high levels. And so I, I had the confidence and, and, you know, the motivation to try to make it happen. And I was able to, through a combination of luck, timing and skill, I got my scholarship to play basketball at Stanford. And I was able to spend four amazing years with my grandmother. She came to every home game I played. She dropped off my clean laundry on Sundays, picked up my dirty laundry, stocked my fridge. You know, she treated me very well uh, at school. But just another example of the game of basketball, bringing people together, bringing our family together. And, you know, I, I carry the values, you know, that, that I, of course, inherited from my family, from my dad, my grandparents, they're the values I'm passing along to my kids. Also the history of the Holocaust, you know, and one thing I, I'm very proud about for my book is that, you know, my book has been an accessible way for people to engage with Holocaust history because there's an interesting basketball story. There are fun and funny stories, but there's a really, really important history that we need to share. We need to spread and, and people need to know, you know, and so I take every opportunity that I can to talk about this story, to continue to spread the message, because we all we need to do is turn on the news and see what's happening around the world. You know, we see scenes from Europe right now of families being separated, of mothers and fathers being killed, and there are scenes that could have come out of my book. And I know because of my family's history and all too well what's at stake when people aren't treated fairly. And so that's a a big a big part of why I, I so proud of the book so proud to speak about this story and, and and think it's so important right we 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 can never forget what happened but it's even more than that we have to actively remember you know we have to actively speak about it and so i i'm playing a very small part in that you know through this story but it, it's it's so rewarding to do and you know my grandma who i mentioned is 97 she still talks about the Holocaust often. And I think with survivors, it's often a binary. Either they never talk about it or they feel obligated to. And my grandmother's in the latter camp. And, you know, she says it, it could happen again. You know, people are capable of this. And if we're not vigilant and if we don't stand on the right side of history, you know, you, you, you never know what can happen. And so, you know, I'm grateful for you all who came today. I hope some of you will pick up a copy of the book, read the story you'll get to know a truly extraordinary person in my grandmother. And, you know, my, my dad achieved incredible things and he's, he's a big inspiration and he really is a hero to, to a lot of people. You know, he wore number 18 for the New York Knicks when he played in the NBA, you know, and 18 is the most symbolic number in Judaism. Uh, so he's, he's a Jewish sports icon and I'm very proud of him for that, but it's really my grandmother. Who, who again is the star of our family and the star of this story. So it'll be, you know, it, it'll be a treat if you read it to, for you all to be able to get to know her a bit. And thank you, you know, for listening to, to the story here today. And I'd love to answer any questions that you have. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dan. Wow, that was really powerful. Uh, I, if anyone has any questions, I, I, I think the chat is actually locked, but uh, if I can unmute you. So if you'd like to raise your hand, click on the raise hand if you'd like to ask a question. And I will click on something to allow to talk. And I have a few questions here I wanted to ask you. But if anyone else, if you have a question uh, either uh, to place in the chat, just um, click on the raise your hand icon in the bottom of your screen. And I will, uh, I'll be happy to uh, unmute you so you can ask that question. Um, so I, I do have a question for you. Has, did your grandmother always talk about her experiences in the Holocaust with you as her, her grandchild? Is that, was that always in, in your lifetime or is that something that came about later? She did. She was always very open. Of course, like in an age appropriate way, right? When you're in grammar school, elementary school, of course, you don't share all the details, but she, I knew that 
you know, she had loved ones who were no longer around and she has a very thick accent. And I was just always aware that, you know, we call her Anyu, which means mother in Hungarian. And I always knew Anyu went through something very difficult. And as I got older and more mature, my family shared more details with me. And because we spent so much time together when I was in college, you know, I would I stayed with her during the summers. I would always go to her, her apartment for dinner. And I remember eating with her with a this red notebook I had. And I would just ask her questions and take notes. You know, I was just always very interested. I always had a sense that the history was big, not not just my family's part in it, but just the history period, like the history of the Holocaust was something that I just always cared about. It was my first quarter at Stanford, you know, when I was picking classes new to college, I saw a class on the Holocaust, I signed up immediately. You know, it just was always something I really cared about. I'm lucky that my grandmother is not only open and willing to talk about it, but has an incredible memory. And if you read the book, you'll see the, the depth and the detail. And that's because of her, you know, she was willing to speak about really hard things, but she remembered so many interesting, troubling, heroic details, whatever it was. And so she, she has just always been very forthcoming, you know, and it takes a lot of bravery and courage and, and strength to, to talk about these things. And she's always done that. Wonderful. Uh, that's, a, that's a, a, amazing. Uh, we do have someone, um, uh, Marianne, I'm going to click on the bundle. Let's see how this works. We're going to allow you to talk and you'll be able to ask your question then directly. Here we go. Uh, and I believe you can un here. We'll unmute you now. You can unmute now, Marianne, if you'd like. We'll see if that works. Oh, there we go. Can you hear us? Yes, we can. Well, first of all, thank you. You are um, answering this question for a group of sixth graders in the Tampa Bay area of Florida. We're in Sumter County, and um, we are just learning about the Holocaust in sixth grade. We're going to be reading some poetry. But I'm curious, what advice do you think your grandmother would have for sixth graders who are just learning about middle school and starting their lives, and then also about learning about the Holocaust. What are some things you think she'd want them to know? Yeah, first of all, Marianne, thank you for that. Thank you for joining with the, these students. I mean, this, as I mentioned, like this is why I do this. You know, is is to have younger folks engage with this story. And there's a really cool, interesting basketball story, but this history of the Holocaust is so important. So thank you so much for that. And hello to all the students who joined today. What my grandmother would say to you all is read about the Holocaust, learn about the Holocaust, speak about it. You know, we need to know our history. And there's been a lot of data for for folks your age around. And it's been really troubling how little people know about the Holocaust and even older than you. People who are in college or, or past college, a lot of people don't even know what the Holocaust is and that that is such a shame, not only because it doesn't honor those who are affected, but if we don't know about history, that's how it repeats itself. And the Holocaust, it seems like it was, you know, it was something that happened in history and we read about it in books, but it wasn't that long ago and it wasn't that far away. You know, my grandmother, who I will call in a few hours and we'll talk and we'll FaceTime with my kids, she was there and she survived. So I think to be the age that you all are, to learn about it, to take it seriously, to understand what happened is really, really important. And then the other thing she would say is treat people with kindness and respect because that's the root of goodness, you know, and how we prevent things like this from happening. The last thing, I know her very well, so I can, I can tell you all the things that I know she would say is you should stand up for people who aren't being treated fairly. Because just if it's not your group, you know, whoever it is, no one deserves to not be treated fairly. And my grandma knows all too well what can happen at the extremes, right? So, and, and at your age, I, listen, I was in sixth grade. I remember my sixth grade teacher. I remember all my friends. Like, you know, I'm a little bit older than that now, but you'll, you'll remember these days when, when you're my age. And, you know, kids get made fun of and people get teased and things happen. And, I always had a sense of trying to stick up for people, trying to, you know, make sure that that wasn't happening, right? Because th there's nothing good that comes out of that, that type of treatment, that type of behavior. So 
that's what my grandmother would say to summarize, learn about this history, treat people with respect and kindness and stand up and say something and use your voice when you see people who aren't being treated right. Go That's ahead. a great message. A great message. Oh, I heard you all. I heard oh, you wow. all. Wow. I love it. I love it. Uh, thank Marianne, you so much. Thank you. No, thank you. This is great and so meaningful for students to, to hear a bit about this story. And uh, yeah, I hope you get some copies of the book for the kids to read. Uh, it'll, it'll be meaningful. And thank you again so much for joining. I put them in my Amazon card already. There you go. They'll, if, if, and if I could ever be helpful, if you want me to send signed book plates for the kids, you just let me know. Cause really like speaking to students is something that I really, really love to do. And, and I'm grateful, honestly, I'm grateful. A anyone in that class who reads this book, I'm grateful. And I'll ask you, I can't see you, but raise your hand in that room. If you've ever met a Holocaust survivor. And there so, are zero hands, zero hands raised. And, this, and that's okay. And that, that, that's that's not, why we teach it. That's why you teach it. And that's not your fault, of course, right there. That generation is older. But if you read my book, you will know a Holocaust survivor. You will, you'll know my grandmother. And you'll see, you'll also know that anything is possible and that you should always have hope through difficult, difficult situations. And so again, I appreciate you all, Mary, and I appreciate you uh, dialing in today. And if I could ever be helpful moving forward, please reach out. I, I will, and thank you. And thank you for sharing your grandmother and her thank story. Thank, thank you. you. Well, uh, Dan, we got another question, but I've got to say I, that actually made my day. Uh, Marianne, you're the uh, class being involved. Mine too. Uh, that, mine too. <laughs> yeah, it, it, does, it just it really just uh, knowing that students are learning that is fantastic. Yeah. Uh, we do have another question. I'm going to last talk. Uh, I believe it's. I'm making sure I've uh, Mr. Randy uh, uh, Randy Falk. I'll make sure I'm pronounced the name right. I'm going to go ahead and allow them to talk. What you'll do is you have to unmute yourself if you'd like to go ahead and. There you go. I was just uh, raising my hand to recognize that I've known Holocaust survivors. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> but while I'm on the on the line, I really appreciated this discussion. I played college basketball myself, and uh, in the day had good mechanics, but never quite made your level. <laughs> well, where did you play in college? I played at a little school called St. Lawrence University in upstate New York, and. Sure. One of the reasons I went there was because they had a world class hockey team. So I thought a short Jewish kid from Brooklyn might be able to walk on and make the team. And it actually panned out for a while. Smart. It's a good thing. Let me ask you, where, what high school in Brooklyn did you go to? No, no, I went to high school on Long Island. Baltimore. Oh, OK, because, you know, my dad went to Forest Hills High School in Queens, you know, so um, I, I know a lot about kind of the high, high school basketball in New York. but. And we, I also, by the way, went to summer camp at Kutcher's in the Catskills. So oh, sure. no upstate New York. Well, my dad, as I write in my book, was a waiter at Camp Sequoia in the Catskills as well. So we know that area. And uh, thank you for joining today. I really appreciate it. Yeah, my dad played for NYU with uh, Red Holzman and Red Auerbach. We're at City College at the same time and Dolph Shays. So, wow. So uh, listen, he played I, in the garden before there was an NBA. That's incredible. I hope. I hope you pick up a copy of the book. You'll read Red Holtzman was my dad's mentor. He was yeah, like I, a grandfatherly figure to me. Uh, uh, he, he used to, you know, he knew I liked the game and he's, you know, he called me Danny. He said, Danny, I'm going to be your agent. Okay. And all it's going to cost you is 10%. So, and for those who don't know who Red Holtzman is, he's a legendary coach in the NBA. He was named one of the top 10 coaches in NBA history and a Jewish, Jewish man from Brooklyn. And uh, yeah, someone who's kind of like a grandfatherly figure to me. And so, yeah, and I write about him at the book and someone my dad loved a lot. Really a special person. Well, it's in my Kindle. <laughs> great, great, great. Uh, you'll like it. And, and yeah, you'll like it. Please, again, reach out. And it's, I, I love connecting with anyone over the story. And New Yorkers, you know, really, this really resonates because it's a New York story. Yeah. Thank you so Thank much, you. man. I appreciate Thank it. You. And, and I believe... Uh, Marianne, did your class have another question? You can unmute if you'd like. You and I saw your hand go back. How, how do we reach out? You can email me directly. I'll give you my email right now. It's grun20, G-R-U-N-2-0 at gmail.com. I also have a website, which I think someone 
has dropped in the chat or can drop in the chat again, which is dangrunfeld.com. And there's a contact link there that goes directly to me. Thank you. Yeah, no, please do. Everyone sees, does everyone see that in the, uh, I'm sorry, are you able to see that in the chat, the, uh, the uh, information that we have there? Just making sure. I don't see oh. it. Okay, I think, uh, let's see, we'll. I, I can see it for what it's worth when I open oh, up. Oh, you know, I believe, box, you know, okay. I I, here, I'll, I'll make sure, I was gonna double post it here. I believe it actually, unfortunately, went out to panelists, so we'll do, uh, me, I'll post it really quick. And, uh, and here, I believe this is. We can see it, yes, thank you. Okay, there we go. Make sure I got that. Perfect. Um, and let's real quick, I do want to ask a question. Uh, so when you first decided to, you know, write this book, this is a very personal story for you and your family. And uh, I, so I'm, I'm sure it must have changed you. When did you decide to write this story? And then uh, how do you go about gathering the information? I mean, you're putting everything together, your whole family story. Uh, how did that, I'm sure that must have changed you or, uh, you know, uh, so how did it affect you? Yeah, the decision to write the book is interesting because it's not something that happened in my head. It's something that happened in my heart. And that's the truth. I, I, it's, it's, this story meant so much to me and I felt it, right? Growing up, I felt how much basketball had done for my family and what my grandparents survived and went through. And I, I, all, it just always was inside of me. And I've, I've loved to write, you know, I've done a lot of it. And when I retired from my professional basketball career and I finally had some space, it was kind of like a tidal wave. It, it, and so the decision, yes, I made a decision. I remember looking at my wife at dinner one night and saying, I'm gonna do it, like now's the time. But it just, it, it, it's just something that came, you know, it's something that I, that I had to do. It's almost like I couldn't keep it inside. And so then I had to get to work. <laughs> it's kind of part like the, what you heard from the story. That's what my grandparents did when they got to America. That's what my dad did with basketball. That's what I've had to do in different things in my life. And this was no exception. I had to get to work. That's when the year and a half of research came in. You know, I interviewed my grandmother, interviewed my dad, recorded those conversations, transcribed them, talked to family members all over the world, leveraged secondary sources like, you know, the Holocaust Museum, Yad Vashem, Encyclopedia Britannica, just trying to like contextualize my family story in, in history. And so that was an immense process. And, and just to understand all that had happened and there are, I mean, I mentioned my grandmother being saved by Roel Wallenberg. You know, there are infamous Nazis who are part of this story. Adolf Eichmann, Dr. Mengele. These are like really notorious people throughout history who touch this story, who I had to research. So it was just, just a, a, a real effort to, to know the history. And then, of course, I had to tell it. So it took me eight months to, to write my first draft. And it was a year. So it took me five years from the time I started to the time the book came out which is a good lesson for the stu for students, right? They have a great saying, people are an overnight success story 15 years in the making. So anytime you see someone who's had success or they are doing something that is people like, and that, that's the case with my book. You know, I've been on Good Morning America talking about this story. I've been on the NBA on TNT with, you know, Shaquille O'Neal and Charles Barkley are talking about my story. These are all been really cool and meaningful things, but it took so much work, so much time, so much failure you know, I had so I had people say no, publishers, agents, right? So that's the journey I kind of went on. But there's also an emotional journey. And that was the second part of your question, right? Like, what did I feel? What did I learn? My, my family story is just indicative of the human experience where we laugh, we cry, there's joy, there's pain. And our highs have been very high, right? Top of the Olympic podium, stardom, that but the lows have been just unthinkably low, the Holocaust and my uncle passing away tragically. The emotions that I experienced researching this book and writing it, it ran the gamut of, of those life experiences. I laughed, I cried, you know, I learned, I learned so much about, about the details of the story, you know, things about that happened in the Holocaust that I wasn't aware of, things that happened to my dad in America that I wasn't aware of. I also learned about myself right? Why I am the way I am. I was always very motivated. I hope that you students, you know, that you, you care about school and that you work hard. And I was always that way. I wanted to do really well. And 
I learned that a lot of that was because I had ancestors who didn't get a chance to get an education. My grandmother, she says to this day, she was the only kid in her town who liked going to school. She loved to learn. She went, she was excited to go. My grandma never got a chance to get her education, formal education because of the Holocaust, right? And so I had a chance to go to college at Stanford University. I was gonna, I was gonna make sure that I took advantage of that. And so you mentioned me being an academic All-American at Stanford, which I'm very proud of. Part of that was, you know, my my motivation. And, and I learned a lot about where that came from. And and so it was, this has been, this has been the most, you know, of course, having a family and, and it is, is what matters most. This has been among the most meaningful things that I've ever done for, for these reasons. And wonder, that's, that's amazing. Um, I, I, I'm sure it was uh, um, experiential for you. Uh, and, and really, uh, I hope everyone gets a chance to, to share your story. I do have a question here. I'm gonna, uh, I only have a name of G here. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna allow to talk. And if you'd like to just go ahead and just unmute your mic and you feel free to ask your question. Hi, first I'd like to thank you for this. This has been very interesting and I do know Holocaust survivors. Yeah. Um, but I was also wondering if you ever videotaped interviews with your grandmother. Yeah, thank you for that. We, we have. So she made her taste with the show of foundation, right, which is a project that I think Steven Spielberg spearheaded, which to, which is to capture these testimonies. And so my grandmother made her tapes with the show of foundation. She made her taste with another Holocaust organization out of the Bay Area. I have taped her, just filmed her, just answering mm -hmm. questions and talking. Uh, yeah, it's important. It's important. And I'll, I'll share a little inside info with this group. This is fairly new, but we're doing, there's a, a filmmaker has, you know, been interested in, in this movie. And so we're going to do a documentary film about the story. And so my grandmother has been filmed in that capacity a little bit so far, which is, that's very exciting. But yeah, it's, it's important. It's important to hear it. You know, of course, reading the story, you, you relive it in, in through the pages of a book but to hear it from the mouth of survivors, you know, and, and my grandma, like she speak, her English is great. It's thick. The accent is thick. Like you hear, you hear it, you hear where she's from, what she's been through. And so, yeah, those, those tapes exist and they're really important. Yeah. And then I was also wondering how old your children are and if they understand the history of your family. So they don't understand it, but by no fault of their own, my oldest son is three and a half and my youngest son is seven months old. Oh yeah, so they would. <laughs> they're little, they're little guys. Uh, so of course they, they don't know the history yet, but they will. Of course, I would always, I would have, I would have always communicated it to them verbally, but now I can give them this book and they'll be able to they'll be able to experience it for themselves and and that's so as you can imagine as a parent right that that's so meaningful and they facetime with my grandmother every day and that's every why the, the video of of these um uh interviews would be interesting for them to have also for them to yes. actually see her answering some of the questions about their history yes yeah you're 100 percent right you know to to be able to spend time with her always right and, and see her and hear her and yeah it is it is really important so i appreciate that thank you and i have one more question i'm sorry to hog all your no, time please. but you're so interesting i'm here um, so do you do any book tours or um interviews um around the country i'm i'm calling from florida also but i'm calling from central florida deltona florida um and i think it would be really interesting to see you in person <laughs> Yes, I, I do. I do. I'll actually be in Florida this week, uh, this coming weekend on Sunday, I'll be in Jacksonville. Oh, okay. That's a couple I, of hours. Away. Yeah, I don't know how far that is, but but that, that's all to say, yes, I do. I, I travel. I speak about the book. I speak about the story. I, re I mean, I, it means the world to me, as you can probably see, you know, that's why. And that's why, Marianne, like for you to bring these students on is so awesome because that's, you know, just to touch, to reach people, to communicate the message, like it, it's the best. So I really enjoy doing it. So if you know anyone, if you know any organizations who are interested in having me, you know, you have my info, please have them reach out. We can figure it out. Thank you and have a wonderful day. Thanks so much. Fantastic. Um, the, uh, another question that kind of popped up uh, that we were talking about was, so as you as you told your story, was there, 
was there anything that you learned about, you know, you've heard the story from your, from your grandmother and your family. Was there anything that you uncovered or discovered um, you know, as you were writing the story that surprised you? Yeah, there, there, there were things, of course. I mean, particularly the history of the Holocaust. I mentioned Dr. Mengele, you know, who's well known as one of the most notorious Nazis. I had, I had one great aunt who survived Auschwitz and she was evaluated there by Dr. Mengele. And I didn't know that. I, I learned that through some documentation that one of her daughters had provided for me. And that's chilling. You know, he's, he's this figure that I've, that I've studied, that I've heard of. And so for, for history to be so close to you, you know, it is, it, it's pretty staggering, you know, so there were, there were hard details, you know, things around my uncle's death that I wasn't aware of. And that's something that my uncle passing away is something my dad doesn't really talk about. Basketball was his savior, you know, from, from that, that horrible, horrible occurrence. And so I had to ask questions. And so I learned, you know, details of, of that, that I just wasn't aware of. I also learned happy details, you know, things about my dad as an immigrant in the United States and basketball and what it, you know, what it did for him and just stories. One thing that I learned, I actually learned it a few weeks before the book was set to be kind of like locked before it had to go to print. I learned this really cool detail that I wrote into the book because I connected with the gentleman who was the he was the team manager for Tennessee Volunteers when my dad was in college. And again, I mentioned my dad was such a phenomenon, right? He was bigger than life when he was at Tennessee. And my grandparents, as I told the story, they didn't see him play until he was a junior in high school. But after that, they they never missed the game. They were his biggest fans. And the the manager of the Tennessee team, his job for every road game, immediately after the games ended, he had to go up into the stadium of the, the opposing team and find a payphone and call my grandparents collect in New York City to tell them how the game went and how many points my dad scored. That's how much my grandparents needed to know. You know, the University of Tennessee, they're known for their color orange. They had this really distinct bright orange color and, he, and they would wear orange blazers. And so it was funny to hear the manager say he'd be in Kentucky or Florida or Mississippi State, and they were like going to kill him because he's from the opposing team and he's, <laughs> you know, and he's on the concourse finding a payphone to call my grandparents collect to tell them about the game. And that's such a fun detail, but it just shows the devotion that my grandparents had and the pride that my grandparents had in my dad. Wow, amazing. Um, well, I, I don't see any other, uh, I'm looking to see if I'm, I don't want to take away from any of our, our attendees questions if, uh, if they have any, so I'm going to throw one more out there. And actually, you mentioned you're going to Jacksonville this weekend, and uh, you know, kind of wrapping, you know, tying things. And uh, you know, in your book, you write about experiencing anti-Semitism in America, and you're going to Jacksonville. I don't know if you noticed, but it's been Jacksonville's made the news recently mm -hmm. uh, for anti-Semitic messages being posted uh, that are being written on walls uh, outside of the, uh, the field at the at the in, in Jacksonville during the Florida Georgia game. Uh, most recently, uh, you know, large anti-Semitic messages. And when you, you know, when you go to these areas and you talk to people, um, you know, um, at schools, uh, how, how does that affect you and how do you deal with it and how, what message you send out as far as people, you know, reading your book or hearing you and, and learning about, you know, how to, uh, how you, how you dealt with anti-Semitism uh, and others who might be experiencing the same thing. Yeah, listen, it's terribly upsetting. Anytime you see an act of hatred per perpetrated against a specific group, it's, it's always upsetting. I am very honest in my book about the anti-Semitism that I experienced as a kid, that I experience now. And I think I don't think you can be Jewish anywhere in the world and not experience it. And again, what I, the, to the comment I made earlier, it's made me very sensitive to try to treat everyone with fairness and with kindness, you know, and not, not make assumptions about people, not judge people, get to know people for who they are, when I see news like we've been seeing lately, Jacksonville is an example, there's been other examples. It just kind of, it, it reaffirms my kind of resolve and my commitment to doing things like this. And again, to reference the, the, the class who's here today, like to be able to share the message of equality, of decency, of humanity, you know, for my book to be a, a little bit of a source of support for those who are going through it, for those who wanna learn about it, to put the, the messages, the positive messages, the important educational messages out there, that that's so that's so important. And so I think that like advocacy looks different for different people. 
you know, you can use your voice, you can use your resources, you can use your vote. I love to write. So I use my pen, right? And I wrote this book. And now this story is kind of my vehicle through which I can talk about the things I care about. But when again, it, it goes back to what we were saying earlier, like for me, seeing injustice, intolerance, prejudice, like, I, I want to, I want to be speak up against that to the to the extent that I can, right? I don't, my platform is limited, right? I, I but we all can do our part. And I think if you, you know, there's a, there's a saying in Judaism, like if you save one person, you save the world. And that's the truth. Like there, you never know who you can touch. And so if there are however many people listening today, if there's one person who really internalizes these messages, who ch either maybe changes behavior, maybe sticks up for someone who needs it, like that's what it's all about. I, wonderful. Well, uh, I, I think it's bringing us to a close. I don't see any other uh, questions. And actually, you kind of uh, answered my final question, you know, your, your takeaway from your message, the book, uh, you know, learning about your story. They want to real quick, has your grandmother read the book? I know she's yeah. lived the story, but has she read the, has she read the book and given you her approval of, uh, of, of, you know, how you told her story and her family story? She has. And it was difficult, very difficult for my dad because basketball took him away from all these hard things. So it was hard for both of them, but yes, they're very grateful, very proud. The response has been really, really amazing. And so that, that gives them a lot of pride. My grandma, this is actually the first time I've told anyone this, actually, I didn't even tell my wife this, because uh, my grandma just told me this yesterday on the phone that, you know, her name is Lily and she lives in a retirement community, but I write about her in the book. I call her Anyu, which means mother in Hungarian. And that's how she's referred to in the book. And she told me yesterday, that people in her community are starting to call her on you because that's who she is in the book, you know? And I said, that's very funny, you know, cause these are her friends. But uh, so, you know, her, her community has read it. They've all really loved it. They know what a hero she is, you know? So yeah, that's, that part's been amazing, but she's read it. She's the biggest supporter. And, you know, she, she even said to me yesterday, cause I'm traveling and I said, I'm traveling here for the book and there. And she said, oh, it sounds like the book's doing really well. And I said to her, you know, it's because of you. And she immediately says, no, this is you, you wrote it, you know, but she, she deflects all kind of any type of credit or anything like that, but it is because of her. And if you read it, you see that she, she's what makes it really special. Well, you're, you're carrying her story. Uh, and I think that's, that's really important. Um, we have one more question from the classroom. Uh, if you'd like to uh, go ahead and unmute, you're on. The kids have actually just left my classroom to go to lunch. We can't okay. interfere at lunches, but what they, they, I just want you to know what a difference you made for them today. Um, we are, I'm introducing the lesson. It's something I feel very passionate about, but it's hard because they don't have any of the history. I'm an English teacher, so they don't have any of the history. They haven't learned that yet. So for them right now, I just want them to know, and they kept saying, so that happened to his grandmother, to his grandmother. And I said, yeah, you know, and so that when you talked about being in Jacksonville, it's two and a half hours from us. They want to know if we can do a field trip. Wow. So where in Jacksonville are you going to be? I don't know that we can do a field trip, but I'd like to share that information with parents. And I'm going to find you on Sunday. So they, okay. Oh, but, great. It's so it's I think it's, it's the JCC. I my if I'm not mistaken, uh, yeah. Can I it, email yeah, you and get the information? Sure, sure, let do that, do that. Okay, okay. But thank you for okay. what you said and, and thank you for being a great teacher. Like that's what it takes. Like it takes well, great, ed great educators to expose the youth to these themes, you know, to do it in, listen, the Holocaust is hard. These kids, like it, it's not, you know, it's not like the most uplifting subject. So you have to find access points to it. and. The fact that you saw this talk, you said, oh, this is, you know, I'm sure you thought, oh, this might be interesting for them. There's a basketball component. Like, thank you for being creative and resourceful and, and committed to your students. Really, it, that's, that's what it takes. Oh, thank you. That's, they're my passion. They're my classroom kids. They know that. Yeah. Um, awesome. They're a great group of kids. They're so excited. And, you know, they were like, so we have to go to lunch. I'm like, yes, you have to go to lunch. I'll get in trouble. But one of the things they love the most was you referring to me as Mary Ann. Because they I'm sorry. Was, was Mrs. Gages. I and should they have were said. Like, they were, I'm so they sorry. Were like, but no, 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 thank you. Because it it brings home that whole 
this is real. We are right. people. We are sharing stories. So thank you for doing that. Thank, well, thank you. you. That, thank you, Miss Gages. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, thank you. It just I, I can't say enough. I'm I'm very pleased and thank you to the Holocaust Museum for providing the link so we would know about this. Um and I'm gonna I'm not probably not gonna do Amazon. I'm gonna try and find the books at a Barnes and Noble and maybe we can get them autographed or something for the kids. So actually, you know, if you great. When you email me, if you want to buy, I can get you a discount through the publisher if you're interested in certain things. Yes. Like I could I could take care of you. So and we could do book plates and stuff like that. So if, so we could email me, we could figure something out. I appreciate that because when I asked them, you know, we were unmuted and I said, how many of you want to want to read the book? And every hand went up and I was like, oh, Miss Gay just can't afford for a class set. But, you know, and then I thought, well, maybe we can read it out loud or something. Now, is there any parts of the book that would be inappropriate for a sixth grader that I might have to skim over? Or Sixth grade, there, there's some profanity, there are F-bombs. Uh, there the are, F -bomb? yeah, there, there, there are F-bombs. Okay. Then we won't be reading it out loud because yeah. one of the little rules of Florida is as a teacher, if I were to drop the F-bomb, I would lose my certification. So don't do that. Uh, yeah. No, no I, I, I don't want to do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There, there's like light profanity. There's details of the Holocaust, but no, there's, there's nothing outside of that. Okay. Okay. All right, I'll do a uh, parent permission before we read it, but yeah, yeah so absolutely. Please, please email me, and if, if you wanted to buy copies in bulk, we could do like a, a pretty nice discount, so we'd figure something out. All right, thank you, thank you. you I will it. definitely email you today. All right, thank you again for sharing the story. Thank you to the host. It's thank so hard so to oh, find, it's so hard to find contemporary things for the kids. Yeah. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Please tell, tell your friends, your the fellow educators, you know, and they can always reach out because I, I, you know, this is important to me. So, you know, spread the word. Thank you for that. And you're always well, able to reach out as well. Anyone's able to reach out as well uh, to the center, to our education department, uh, it'd be emailing us directly. We'll be happy to uh, help connect you. Uh, and also with uh, some of our lessons for the state of Florida that, uh, that we, we kind of uh, work in tandem with. Uh, for Holocaust education, because next week in the state of Florida is Holocaust Education Week. Okay. Um, yes. Yeah, uh, commemorating the uh, the uh, anniversary of Kristallnacht. Uh, so we do have another program next week. Uh, with we have we have a, uh, three Holocaust survivors who are uh, will be uh, will be uh, joining us next week uh, live with our CEO Tally uh, Dipple. That'll be an evening. Uh, um, Zoom as well as in person. Uh, so Dan, if you stay in town, you feel free to join us on Wednesday night. Uh, but we, we want to thank uh, thank you so much for your time. I wish we had more time uh, to spend with you, but we do need to uh, close up the session because yep. 102. But uh, thank you all for joining us. Uh, thank you, Dan, for sharing uh, your family's story uh, and sharing your time with us today. This has been uh, really engaging, and uh, I was uh, just uh, so excited to see so much engagement uh, after you uh, you know uh, finished your session. Uh, but thank, thank you for you, having Jen. me. Really a pleasure, and everyone. Uh, our li links that we have are in the chat, as well as to uh, for uh, going to Dan's site, as well as to uh, give at the uh, for the Holocaust Center, because programs like this are only possible with uh, with your donations uh, and contributions. And thank you so much for all the engagement, and we appreciate you all. Dan, have a wonderful weekend. Have a safe trip to Jacksonville, and thank you for joining us again. Thanks so much. Take care, everyone. Thanks right. for having me. Thank Take you. Care. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs>